We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and oh my God, we have so much to discuss based on this season of Drive to Survive because uh, that was a lot. discuss because we don't agree on a lot of things. Uh, so there will yeah. be, I don't know, we'll, we'll have to see who... Uh, ends up with the winning arguments of this but um yeah I'm very excited we had a lot to watch in a short yeah. period of time came out on Friday yeah. we're recording on Sunday did not give ourselves very much time for this but here we are yeah well I mean I I, I know that it took you a little bit longer to watch I woke up Friday morning at around 7 turned on drive to survive at around seven fifteen, and then finished the entire thing I think I was done by like 3 30 um I had to have been done by 3 30 because that's when I had to leave the house for a gymnastics meet um but I crammed every all 10 episodes of drive to survive into one sitting which I don't necessarily recommend um but I I got it done my brain is a little squishy right now uh but I survived drive to survive (laughs) it's a shirt I survived drive to survive um Gunther couldn't wear it just kidding um I know R.I.P um yeah no I've been super sick and I just did not have the brain capacity to sit and watch it so I finished it today um and got to process it but it was I don't know I mean we'll get into our opinions and thoughts and feels but it was a season it was a season. yeah and it, this like it, it finally was, it was shuts the door on the 2023 season and we can look forward yeah. to 2024 this weekend yeah, it is. It is race week. It it is. It that is, is race week. It, it's Holy so shit, weird Catherine, to say we that made it. we made yeah. it. We 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 survived our first off season of the show, and now we are we are going into our first full year of of going off track. Um, but to get back on track, uh, we have so many things to discuss about Drive to Survive, um, and I think one of the polarizing rumors that came out that in the days before the season started, once the full trailer was released, was the Danica Patrick of it all. Yeah, I mean, so I'm going to be honest. She's kind of a non-factor for me. Like, I, she's not my favorite presenter. Um, I, it didn't really have any effect on me at all. I get why they did it. Um, I think, you know, we have Will Buxton and we have a lot of people, you know, who the Brits know and love. I mean, we do too, because we get the Sky Sports broadcast in the US on ESPN, but I think bringing in an American helps with the American fan base. Also bringing a woman in helps with the, you know, woman fan base. Um, but I don't, I don't think she added a lot to it. Honestly, I could, it, it's neither here nor there. Take it or leave it. it I don't, it wasn't big for me I don't know That's yeah I I heard you know a lot I, I I heard that there were a lot of people who were like really mad about it and like you she's I not my favorite that. either um but sh- I I did feel her being in there though like I yeah but I mean there are some people out there who hate women um and think women don't belong in motorsport but that's an entirely different discussion um I felt that she was less annoying um with the commentary she was doing on on drive to survive than say on sky sports um she, yeah. she said some you know things that people would consider dumb um but so does will buxton and those just get turned into funny memes um because he's not hated by the the overall fan base so i think that you know it's like that's not the thing to get upset about the thing no. to get upset about is something we'll talk later about. <laughs> well and i think too Will Buxton is very knowledgeable about F1 specifically. He is a journalist coming from that perspective. And then we have Danica Patrick, who, you know, is an American, take her or leave her, whatever. But she does offer an interesting driver perspective. I know she's never driven an yes. F1, but motorsport driver, you know, whatever. She can still provide some bit of driver context outside of the F1 driver. So it is nice to sometimes get another perspective that isn't necessarily one of the 20 drivers on the grid. And I think something too, that's interesting is they brought someone in to give more of a perspective from 
like team principal management's perspective that also isn't in the sport that, by bringing in Claire Williams. So yeah. I think now having three different, you know, non-team tagged people getting a little bit more of an unbiased opinion or thought or point of view, I do think adds to the show. Um, I just wish they gave better commentary this year. I didn't love all of the commentary. I feel like some of it was fluff just to have extra people, but I'm glad now that it's not just like Will Buxton is the one giving all non-team related commentary. You know what I mean? Now we have like three different point points of view. Yeah. And I personally enjoyed having Claire Williams back. She was at one point, one of the most powerful women in formula one in, in motorsport. Um, and, you know, obviously Williams struggled and, and, you know, her family had to, to sell to uh, the Dorlington capital who own them now. Um, but I thought it was, it was nice. My personal conspiracy theory for why Claire was involved and in an increased role. Cause she had like a 32nd commentary bit in season five was because Gunther Steiner parted ways with Haas, they needed somebody to, um, you know, really cover the team principal perspective that Gunther usually provided. Um, and that's why they brought her in. And I feel like they did bring her in last minute. Um, and I think that in the grand scheme of everything going on with Haas, I think that was a good thing. Yeah. And I mean, it's, we all love Gunther. But I think it's good to get some of these team principal management perspectives from someone who's not on a team actively making decisions or who, like, doesn't like this certain team or doesn't like this team. Like, that's what is the drama and the entertainment of it. But to get that behind-the-scenes perspective and the behind-the-scenes knowledge, to get it from someone who's not necessarily, like I said, tagged to a team, I think she does provide a really good commentary there and a really good insight as well. Yeah, exactly. It, so I, I thought, I thought, I, like, I thought it was a good move. Um, I think it's a good I, I like ad having, having her around. Her do, yeah, I think it's a good ad having her, you know, have more spots than Gunther when it comes to like talking about TP stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, but anyway, moving on, um, the season started with a bang, uh, with a bike accident. <laughs> <laughs> and so way. of course <laughs> we we had to discuss the bike accident and starting you know all the way at the top of Aston Martin with uh Daddy Stroll who of course owns the team um and I think with with this episode it reminds me that we do need to do an F101 on how Aston Martin came to be in the fall of Force yeah. India we'll get to that um I thought that there were some moments that were like a little overplayed and over dramatic like Lawrence Stroll talking about how much he loves Lance as a father. I'm like, yeah, he had a bike accident. And he broke his wrist and he broke his, his toe. He didn't die. So first point where we don't agree very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, I see. I think again, I love this show in its pure form of getting a behind the scenes, more intimate look at the owners, CEOs, team principals and drivers. So seeing him like show emotion and be like, yeah, obviously I'm the owner and I want us to do really, really well. But at the end of the day, I'm his dad. Like it does. We make fun of daddy stroll all the time and Lance and like the in, infinite contract. But at the same time, it's, it's nice to see like he doesn't take it to a point where he's no longer his dad. You know what I mean? I thought the bit where Lance was like, yeah, you know, me and my dad, we go way back. <laughs> I laughed at that. That was a good line. Was really funny. It was yeah. so funny. And like, but I don't know. I, I didn't mind it. I didn't think it was over dramatized. Like it was a big thing and people were freaking out and that is scary mm -hmm. and it is a, you know, a big deal. So um, I don't know. I, it was nice to kind of see him humanized a little bit because you see every other pan and he's just like stone cold, like what, six, five big man monster on the track and it's like who would go near that he looks super scary but then it kind of like brought him back down to earth a little bit I don't know I I really enjoyed the Aston Martin episode and seeing everything I think it made me excited to see what's going to come out of Aston Martin because Lance Stroll seems like someone you don't fuck with for lack of a better term and he's going to throw everything he has into making this a world championship team, which is really, like, really cool to see. And I really hope, you know, Fernando does win again and all these things. They have a really good car, yada, yada, yada. 
Um, but I just don't know. The thing that I'm questioning is, you know, will he keep Lance there if he really wants to win and he really wants to do all these things? So that's that's a really good question. Yeah, I, I did enjoy the episode. Maybe it's my, you know, lack of ability to, you know, connect to my emotions that thought that the the Lawrence Stroll dad bit was a little overblown. Um, uh, but I, I, I did enjoy it. I did think that they focused they overfocused a little too much on, on the strolls for obvious reason, but I think that they did so by sacrificing Fernando's storyline. Um, and I really feel like Fernando's Fernando had some really good bits, but I feel like Fernando was minimized compared to Lance, which doesn't make sense to me because Fernando was the one who had all the podiums and had all the success that Aston Martin had. So, so that was my issue there because we had some of Fernando in the first episode and then Fernando was shoehorned into the Lewis and Mercedes episode. But it's like, oh, by the way, Fernando's doing really well here where I think that they should have done more it to, you know, at the very least, you know throw in poking fun of the fact that Fernando lost a podium and then gained it back and you know Mercedes had to drive the trophy across town to the Aston Martin facility yeah well and I also think like I had the same thought of he had an amazing season I love how they threw in a few like oldest driver on the grid yeah at him too um but at the same time thinking through it I wonder just how much access he was giving Netflix to you know what I mean like it could be on mm-hmm. his side because in previous seasons like he hasn't been the face of Drive to Survive like let's say a Daniel Ricardo or, or someone like yeah. that um I think it could also be on him seeing like he didn't want to do a full storyline and he was just there as a supporting act so you know yeah I mean, I mean- you you did you did see that for a number of drivers in the in the top of the standings yeah. um that that were really minimized in favor of like their team principles instead um all the <clears> red bull there i know i was going to say like if you've never heard of f1 and you started drive to survive with this season you'd be like wait who's max verstappen <laughs> yes he which gets, is like he gets a 2 minute montage at the at the end of episode 10 yeah. and that's it. and it's like world champion it's like where the fuck did this come from yeah, which is a little bit of an of an issue that I had with this season, which we'll talk about once we get to Red Bull. Um, but it's it's definitely clear that, you know, some drivers and some some teams were a lot more available than others, which every year you have that. And it's also based right. on like what Netflix chose to, you know, that they wanted to focus on portraying, which Netflix could have done better in some in some elements. We'll, we'll get there in a minute. But one I'm element that I was happy though, so of course nice. not. Everybody's going to be upset with like with the things that we love. Somebody's going to hate, etc. Um, but what I was pleasantly surprised about, and I think I don't know if we talked about this on the episode or if we talked about it before we were recording our um, episode of what we hope to see on Drive to Survive. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised at how much of Fred Vasseur, team principal at Ferrari, that we saw. Um, on Drive to Survive this season, and I loved it. Yeah, I, uh, well, first of all, I love Fred. He's such a character. Yeah. And I knew, like, he'd be a great ad, um, but he really, I want to say he didn't give us anything, but he gave us a lot all at the same time because he's a man of very Mm -hmm. few words. Yeah. No, I thought it was, I thought it was good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. He, he's a man of many facial expressions um, and and a couple a couple good jokes. They 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 showed a lot of him. Um, and, you know, I, I thought that the the whole like people freaking out that he's taking over at Ferrari when he's French and not Italian was pretty, pretty entertaining. Yeah, I well, And I just like the the whole Ferrari Monza bit um, yeah. in general, because I think, again, I like the full, you know, story of episodes. And I think them showing how big of a deal Ferrari is in Italy and how big Monza was to Ferrari and Ferrari fans. I think that's really, it like really takes a step back to be, to understand the Tifosi and understand why it's a big deal and seeing people talk about it in the streets, whether it was staged or not. I think they did a really good job with this episode. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I did like get emotional watching Mons again. <laughs> again, I'm not feeling great, but um, and that might be why. But it's just it's really cool to see 
how much this country loves Ferrari. Yeah, absolutely. It's so. like it is like their their religion out there. Well, it's and Will wild. Buxton said it best. He's like, in Italy, there's two religions. There's the Catholic Church and there's Ferrari. And it it's so true. If you look at those stands, they're painted red. Like that's yeah. all there is there. I which I love. You like I feel like you don't necessarily get that in any of the other races. Maybe Zanfort. Um, but other than that, I think it's, I don't know. I really liked how they did it. And I'm really glad that they gave Carlos his moment to shine. They showed Singapore. They, you know, showed him getting pole and everything. So. Yeah. The, as, I love as... watching Carlos's brother to react. It's yeah. so good. It's so cute. Yeah. As, as good as they made Carlos look was as bad as they made Charles look. Like, one would think that Charles had one of the worst seasons of his career, which it was not a great season for him last year, but they really pumped it up. And and before we talk about that, I also want to add with Singapore, I was very offended by the fact that they erased Lando from that fight with the Mercedes cars. Because like, I get it. They were doing the storyline of the Ferrari versus Mercedes, which I don't think they did very well at all, but especially ignoring how you know none of that would have happened had Lano not been willing to team up with his former teammate who is now not on the same team as him um at a point where McLaren was performing really well and we'll talk about McLaren in depth in a little bit but I thought that that really took away from just you know what people really loved and were excited about with the way Singapore you know played out yeah I think overall Charles Leclerc just kind of complained a lot, which I feel like they had a horrible season. Um, mm-hmm. Again, perspective, right? Ferrari's expectation yeah. is to be world champions. And they didn't get that. They got P3 in constructors. And Charles Leclerc wasn't a world champion. Neither was, was Carlos Sainz. So I feel like to them, it was an extremely disappointing season. But it's all perspective because if Williams had the season that Ferrari did, they'd be like, this is the best season we've had in decades and we're so happy and this is amazing. We're going to, you know, it's just, it's a matter of perspective. So for, for Ferrari and for, you know, all Italians, it was a disappointing season. But Absolutely. I, love, I love how they all flipped on Fred because they were like, oh, oh yeah, Fred, 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 like he can't do this. It's such a weird random hire. And then they win Singapore and they're like, I think Fred can do it. I think he'll bring us back to the yeah. championship. Yeah. I loved it. But that's like yeah. such a sports fan thing. It's like you hate your coach until you win a few games or something. And then you're like, oh, this coach is awesome. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it was, it was, it was pretty funny, but yeah. And then the, 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 I think the saddest bit for, for Charles was at the end with the Abu Dhabi clips where he's like, can I do burnouts? And they're like, no, <laughs> like, they're like let, repeat, let the sand no burn out. <laughs> Let the sad man do some burnouts. I mean, we had that that issue um, two years ago with Mick Schumacher in his last race at Haas, where it's like, can I do a burnout? And they they said no, and then he did it anyway. Uh, but I was just like, way to really nail down just how like miserable Charles is as Ferrari driver. And this is even before he signed that mega extension, um, yeah. which this this was you know, one of those portions, one of the few portions of Drive to Survive that just like did did not age well in the eight weeks since season ended. Yeah, I feel like a lot of stuff didn't age well, but I feel like it doesn't age well almost every season just because of things. True. So, and we're always going to have, you know, a delayed uh, It's. I think it's just louder now based on on the fact that- with with Lewis and and Ferrari and and Carlos. I will so, say yeah. though too with Ferrari, it makes me excited for this season because they made a really good point of like Fred Vasseur stepped into a really hard spot late in the game, not his car, not his strategy, not his people, like completely just kind of stepping in and taking over. Um yeah. So I'm really excited to see what they do this year with like his car, his strategy, his vision, his people. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. This is, you know, I 
you know, there's a, there's a part of me that, that thinks that we'll have to wait until like 26 to really, you know, have the yeah. cemented, this is Fred Vasseur's team and not the team he took over from Mattia Bonato, who did get a lovely little cameo. He it did. was nice to see him enjoying his time making wine. That was feeding um, into, that was feeding into just, you know, the viewers and the fans like loving him. Oh, of Gunner course. Together. There was no reason to bring him in and there was no reason for us to go to the Dolomite vineyards, but. Whatever. It was pr- it, the, the the scenery was pretty, and you know fans just loving Miss Mattia Bonato, who is living the dream, no longer being a team principal. Um, so, but that was something that maybe was not necessary. But what was incredibly unnecessary is we did not need two full episodes of Alpine in Drive to Survive. I want to know how much Ryan Reynolds paid Netflix for these two episodes. Yeah. It, it's it's a lot. It was no. a lot. Like I appreciated the highlight of Otmar's firing. I think I gained a different perspective and I've changed my mind about it. Um, but I and it was kind of it was fine to see the Akon Gasly like enemy frenemy thing, but I didn't need like a again a 40 minute montage of how they hate each other slash now they're kind of okay with each other and you know what whatever I I don't need that yeah I I think that the Netflix cut made Otmar's firing even more awkward than it was like you know go you know going into that weekend and you know hearing you know Otmar Safnauer is going to be leaving Alpine after this race like there were so many other things happening that weekend that you kind of forget to realize that like he just got fired as they rolled up to spa. Like that's, yeah. and, and he has to work another three days. Well, and I think too, for me, like it kind of really clicked in the timeline. Cause like we, we, I watched this happen. I knew what was happening, but mm-hmm. it didn't click to me the timeline. And to me, I think he got extremely blindsided and like, Oh yeah. No. Like it was clear and and it, there were people walking around the paddock and, you know, from other teams who couldn't believe it, huge supporters of Otmar, don't understand what they're doing. This doesn't make sense. Why would you fire someone halfway through your race weekend? That's so dumb. Yeah. Um, and I think it was just, I feel like it was maybe a few people at the top of Alpine who didn't like Otmar and just got rid of him. Because he has a very distinct, very different management style. Oh, yeah. And I don't think they appreciated it or liked it. I also, this is probably just me. I feel like Alpine is so dead set on this, like, we're a French team with all French drivers. And now our team principal is also French. Like, maybe that's not correct. But it seems like they're really pushing for that narrative of being like, we are the all French team and we will bring, you know, glory back to France and blah, 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 blah. I, that's Which the narrative that I happening. got. Right. But that's yeah. the narrative that they kind of portrayed throughout the, the show and the two whole episodes that they got. Oh my God. I can't believe it was two whole episodes. Like they could have cut down on some of like the racing bits and crammed yeah. all that into one episode. Um, but I, I also feel like the Akon Gasly frenemy thing wasn't like an issue this season when you lived through the Formula One calendar. Like, you know, we knew when Gasly was hired that they have a history of cropping each other out of Instagram posts because of things that happened when they were children, but it didn't actually, you know, make an impact on the season live. Um, so I feel like well, a lot of that was... know that. Well, correct, because Alpine was just so irrelevant this year. But, you know, they but they didn't fight each other the same way that like Alonzo and Akon did last year and that like Akon and Perez did back in the Force India days. Um, and I really think that of of the most that they played up for the drama on Netflix, it was the Akon Gasly rivalry frenemy nonsense, which no, I, I didn't need. No, I feel like it was very overplayed, but I mean, they did have several, more than one double DNFs of Alpine because they crashed into each other and that's because you're Mm -hmm. racing your teammate. And so like, that's what I mean. Like maybe it's just the the competitor, but maybe it is just, who knows? We don't know what they're thinking. We didn't, honestly, it was a lot of airtime and not a lot of 
like true understanding substance. from Alpine. Yeah, there's no substance. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I can't believe they got two episodes. They were very irrelevant this year. And they're going to be even more relevant this I year. I mean, they I could think. have given half of one of their episodes to the uh, Alfa Romeo team who was not featured at all. Nowhere! Again, if you're just coming into Formula One, you'd be like, oh, so there's only nine teams on the grid. And it's like, no, there's actually yeah. 10. Alfa Romeo. Yeah, I was on the lookout for anything Alfa Romeo related. And the only thing is, you know, one of the, you know, pit stop, you know, drive to survive. This is a drive to survive episode stingers was an Alfa Romeo car. And like we got a couple bits of, you know, Botas and his mullet and maybe a couple clips of Zhou Guan Yu. And but it was not, was it, it was in like a team, like a group setting. It really wasn't yeah. them at all. And again, we don't know. Maybe they chose not to be accessible. Maybe they, you know, didn't opt in. So that's why we're not getting them. But they almost wiped them <laughs> from the sport. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, oh, was was there a ninth team? I mean, they're not going to be, you know, you can't you can't miss them this year in, in the car that they're driving. Um, but yeah, it was it like, you know, you you can make a game out of spot the Alfa Romeo car, but not a drinking game because you would be very sober by the end of the season. Yeah, it was a lot, but um, and then so Alpine got two episodes, and I also yeah. feel like Alpha Tari got like five. <laughs> I just feel like there's yeah. so much Alvatari coverage and it was all talked about by Christian Horner. <laughs> like, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I will say one of the most egregious bits of like the Alvatari coverage was when they were doing the race stuff and they, they were, they were showing race footage. They kept cutting to the Red Bull pit wall and yeah. giving like Christian Horner's reaction to things that were done by Red Bull drivers, probably Perez, um, that like definitely was like, was not actually like, that was like, Fran like you should put cameras on Franz Tost, who I know like doesn't care because like yeah. he was retiring anyway. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of interesting stuff coming out of Peter Bayer that I, I do think between Helmut Marco making the decision to pull Nick DeVries and Peter Bayer, who is a brand new CEO of AlphaTauri, like that it make it surprises me less that they were so quick to cut him. Um, but I think it was incredibly egregious to have, you know, Christian Horner's in race reactions to things that he was definitely not actually reacting to. Well, he may have been a little bit, but I don't know. It just mm. makes you it makes you really sit and think how closely these teams are tied. Like we know Williams yeah. and Mercedes have a close relationship, but it's also not like you know, Toto is telling James what to do on a daily basis. And right. it feels Toto's like... just telling who who drives in your car. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, when but, there's availability. <laughs> but it also makes you take a step back and think, like, how much is Christian Horner really pulling the strings at Alphatari? How close are they actually linked? Especially because of the whole Daniel bit. Like, if I take one thing away, it's that Christian Horner loves Daniel he will do anything mm -hmm. in his power to get him back into a Red Bull like varsity team seat he I feel like he feels kind of like his race dad a little bit because yeah. he started with the Red Bull junior team and he came up in, in Red Bull racing and um you know Toro Rosso and everything and I think Christian sees him leaving for Renault as something that really hurt and now he's back and they can oh, really yeah. like, get back to where they were I really think Christian has a soft spot in his heart for Daniel Ricciardo and I I personally saw that it was like a little bit of a storyline but you can see how close they are and how much mm -hmm. he wants to support him and give him the space he needs and um I think I think it was Will Buxton who said that he kind of has a blind spot or a soft spot for Daniel Mm -hmm. And he might let him get away with more than others, which I think is good because that means he'll get more time to prove himself rather than right. just being cut like a Nick DeVries. Yeah, exactly. I, th I think that, you know, Nick DeVries' whole story was very, like – they they could have cut the amount of Nick DeVries in half. Like, we did not need to see him cleaning his closet-sized apartment in Monaco. Um, like, we we know he's neater than Yuki. It's fine. It, it's Everyone's neater than Yuki. Um, but I, I just, I really feel like Christian Horner will do 
everything in his power to get Daniel back into that second Red Bull seat. Yeah. Um, and But what was really interesting to me when they got to the Liam Lawson portion, when Daniel broke his hand, um, was I felt that there was an implication that the the competition for that second AlphaTauri race seat was not between Liam and Daniel, but for Liam and Yuki. Um, because when they when they when they made the reference to it being very political, that's where you have to know, and this is something that's not you know, something that's shouted out all the time is that Yuki is actually salaried by Honda. Um, and Honda is, as we know, a very close partner to Red Bull, you know, Red Bull, their Red Bull powertrains and, and AlphaTauri, they provide the engine and all that. So basically they were not in a position to give that second seat to Lawson because Daniel was always going to stay. And it was, you know, they, they couldn't, Based based on what had happened over this you know this whole season, they couldn't sell to, they couldn't sell it to Honda to that you know Yuki was going to lose his drive. Well, and we've talked about this too. Like we've theorized and, and had our conspiracy theory about how Yuki will never leave because he's paid by Honda and they're a big sponsor. Yeah. Um, which and this, if anything, kind of confirmed that. I think it was interesting to see that Danny was co- very concerned about his seat. So yeah. that means. You know, I but I, at the same time, if you, I took a step back and it didn't seem as dramatic as everyone played it out to be in the media. Like it seemed like, yes. Christian, like it was it was not even like it was a non factor. Like they already knew who was going to be in the seat. And it was Christian exactly confirming to to Liam like, hey, you've done great. Keep it up you're a reserve driver, your time will come, but like, we're not making a change. And I feel like Liam got a lot of noise from the media of like, what does this mean for Alpha Tari? Who's actually, you know, blah, blah, blah. When right. I, and the way that it came across to me was like, they already knew they weren't going to change their driver lineup. Great. He came in, he did wonderful. We've got a great third driver, you know, for two of our teams, but they were not going to change their minds or make a different decision. Yeah. Liam Lawson did his job and he executed perfectly um and you know unfortunately you know AlphaTauri visa catch up is just not in the position to move on from Yuki Tsunoda right now so right now Lawson's best hope is that Sergio Perez either finds another drive or gets let go so that Daniel can move back to Red Bull and then he will go into AlphaTauri and move up into Formula One where Lawson absolutely should be yeah no he's a great driver I think he'll absolutely kill it in a few years but I don't think, like, this season wasn't going to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. No, correct. It, it was, it was, it was just he needed to be there while Daniel recovered from, you know, breaking his hand because Daniel's options at Zanvoort in that practice session were break his car by driving into the back of Oscar Piastri or going into a wall. And yeah. he made the choice to go into a wall. Um so, so yeah, it was good. I love that we saw um, Daniel's contribution to Mexico um, yep. because he, Mexico and his performance there, that gave AlphaTauri the position that they were in finishing P8 in the championship. Um, and, you know, did that, that one race and that one performance by Daniel Ricardo gave them millions of dollars in prize money. And so I'm really glad of, of all the little things that um, Drive to Survive did choose to include that that was one of them that they did. Um, I'm also really glad that they included the commentary from Alex Albon because that was yes. that was the cherry on top. So A plus. Alex Albon pretty much like lays out exactly how Netflix is going to show Daniel Ricardo coming back. And he's like, I'm pretty sure they had to change their pants three times when they heard he was coming back. Yeah. Um, but that just killed me because he laid it out perfectly about what was going to happen and like how they're going to cut to things. And um I, yeah, Netflix is obsessed with him. He's a great personality, though. He's great for the sport. Yeah. He's enthusiastic. He's charismatic. Um, but, yeah, like I said, I think we're going to see Horner doing everything in his power to get him in, like, the the Red Bull varsity seat with Max. Yeah, that it'll be really interesting to see how how this year goes. And if if we see, and I, I don't think this is very likely, but if we see something a la 2016 where – um, you know, race four happens and um, Max Verstappen got moved up and Daniel Kvyat got moved down. I don't think that's going to happen between Perez and Ricardo where they would switch. Um, but 
you never know. And I'm curious to see what is ultimately going to play out. Can you imagine uh, Checo and Yuki as teammates? <laughs> I just can't. I don't I think can't that either. Work very well. <laughs> No, I, again, I, th- I think I think Horner knows that too. So yeah. the only way this happens is they cut Checo or they say like, hey man, you're getting up there in age. I think you should retire. And they just like kick him aside and then Daniel moves up and Yuki gets Lawson or someone else. But I don't see him. I don't see Checo going down to uh, whatever they're called now. V-carb. V-carb. Yeah, no, I, I don't either, but it will be interesting to see how it shakes out and when when these announcements for 2025 are made because that's going to be, you know, the top thing on everyone's mind other than the fact that, you know, Lewis Hamilton is leaving Mercedes for Ferrari, which was another oh, thing that aged Mercedes. so badly. <laughs> well, yes, but at the same time, like, it made me really sad and emotional Again, I'm in my feels right now, so everyone yeah. give me a break. But it, I did kind of get teary-eyed and, like, sad just thinking him and – Lewis and Toto have spent so much time together, so many years together, working on the car together. And to see this great relationship kind of crumble made mm-hmm. me really sad because we in every sport you have – not every sport, but almost every sport you have, like, one iconic coach-athlete duo partnership. relationship partnership that you cling to and it's like gold right in yeah. formula one it seems like that is toto and lewis up until you know a few weeks ago when we found out that um he's no longer going to be staying at mercedes but yeah. so watching that and just seeing it kind of end before it ends was really sad to see. And like, I know Lewis came out and said, you know, Toto's listening and we're going to change things and this, that, and the other, but it's, I mean, clearly something happened and he's moving, but it made me sad. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, that it really, and and we discussed this in, in, in the episode where, um, when, when we were talking about Lewis leaving is that this, this was, you know, not entirely financially driven, but Ferrari is willing to pony up hundreds of millions of dollars to Lewis's contract and Lewis's, you know, philanthropic and include, you know, inclusion focused, diversity focused efforts that Mercedes, you know, as, as a company was not willing to, to continue with. Cause Lewis had, had made it clear that he was, you know, very happy to, you know, die in his Mercedes race suit. Um, yeah. But Mercedes as, as a company above Toto was not, you know, down for that. So I think that that, you know, it, it makes Mercedes as an organization not look so great. Um, and I also think that Netflix kind of did Lewis a little dirty with the way they, they portrayed him, especially at the beginning of the episode with that shoot that he was doing with George. Um, and as somebody who isn't a fan of Mercedes or a fan of Lewis Hamilton as a driver, I, it, it didn't strike me as, as the move that Mer- that Netflix should have made. See, and I didn't get that at all. I didn't think they made him look bad. I don't, I didn't get that perspective at all. Um, I thought it really showed how much this decision probably took out of him. Oh yeah. How hard it was. And I think they did a good job of really capturing like how much Mercedes means to him, how big of a deal it is, but also what's important to him. Cause he kept saying like, I told the team at the beginning of the year, the car was shit and they didn't listen to me. And then at the end yeah. of the year, it's like, oh yeah, the car is shit. You were right. And he's like this year, they're like kind of listening. So I think. Beyond the money and all of that, I think it's truly Fred coming to him and saying like, hey, we will listen I'm going to give you a car. Yeah. You tell us what you need. We will listen. We will listen. Where, you know, Mercedes, I think, is more, w- w- didn't listen to him. And they, and they, that he lost that trust. And I think that's kind of what they were trying to show. But I think, honestly, I saw a person who was really grasping at straws, trying to stay with their family but Mm -hmm. also realizing like they aren't the same family I joined 10 years ago or whatever. So I think, I think that's what we saw, not necessarily. And I don't think it made him come off as bad, but that's just my perspective. Well, no, I, I don't have an issue with like 
or I don't think it made him look bad, just like the, you know, the decision making process going through when he was signing that contract extension. I just think that the, 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 when the film shoot and the way that they portrayed him at the film shoot, like not listening, not happy to be there, ready to get things, you know, over and done with, I thought that made Lewis look bad in a way that he probably wasn't um, in, in, you know, in, in real life in that situation. Yeah. But I mean, I would be frustrated and upset too if I was telling my team shit's going poor. No, 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 not not with anything. no, not with the car itself when they were doing the film shoot with those prop cars at the very oh. beginning of the episode. Well, yeah, but that's just yeah, yeah, like yeah. the overall. Like, if you're frustrated, you're frustrated, and like yeah. Because, so I just yeah. I didn't no, I get what you're, I get what you're saying, good. but I yeah. yeah. And then Toto's same joke same. about Lewis and the red overalls. And I, I just, that it's like that, that's kind of funny. Cause you're going to see that in a year. Um, and then really quick non sequitur before we move on when they were, you know, sitting in Toto's office, it occurred to me that every single time formula one moves from one race to another, all of that stuff gets packed away. So there's somebody whose job it is at every track to put those same pictures up on the walls in Toto's office and put the plant in and put the stuff on his desk. And the the fact that like, that is a thing that like is part of the formula one, you know, international circus, like it like for whatever reason it hit me at that point when they were you know filming that that conversation in his office and like that that's a thing that happens at every single race like someone's job is set up Toto's office oh yeah oh yeah yeah I wonder how many assistants he has he has to have like so many several so many wild yeah okay um have we said all we want to say about Mercedes I think we have I think so yeah um Vegas. I'm so sad to see. Well, okay. Before we get to Vegas, I just want to reiterate again. I am really sad to see Lewis and Toto's relationship end. It's really oh, hundred percent. Yeah, so I don't know sad. what Toto's gonna gonna do. He's gonna have to lean on George and. Um... Oh, God. Well, but also I think it's interesting too because they showed a lot of Fred and Toto talking and yeah. like how they've been friends for twenty years and they you know grew up in the sport together whatever we're really good friends blah 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 blah. sitting on the couch like Toto standing up for Fred when they're talking to him about Vegas and how bad things are and they're trying to get content yeah. out of him and Toto's like literally shut up he's pissed <laughs> he's, he's pissed stop it stop <laughs> which and it but and then you see like Lewis leaving for that and they're really good friends and the oh, I can just I can see the drive to survives uh episode next season already oh yeah I just want to know who called Toto if it was Fred or if it was Lewis first yeah exactly like all of those conversations also before we do move on from Mercedes I'm glad I'm glad we saw as much Susie Wolf as we did even though it wasn't Susie Wolf in the context of the F1 Academy um other than she is the managing director of F1 Academy it was nice to see you know Toto and Susie spending time together with their son on the cart track um and they're like the little the 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 jokes of like pat me on the shoulder like like, look supportive (laughs) support yeah I love those two. If I could be their child, I would be. Um, but see, that's what I'm talking about. Like, the off the track, behind the scenes. Absolutely. Fluff. Like, that makes me love those two even more. And also their kid. I love how he's like, he's going to be the cart's so slow. that he's going so slow. We need to upgrade the engine. Let's let's get him off the track and put the big yeah. engine in. It's like, what a dad. And it's like, well, you're going to be, you know, driving racer or a race car driver or whatever, a driver is only your third option like you have other options of what you can be I just their kid is so cute that was like a a nice break from all of just the race content we got which I feel like we got more race content this year than yeah I I I will I will say that it will be awesome if we ever get to see little mini Toto on the grid as a Formula One driver that would be Oh, the storylines there. It'll be like a daddy stroll 2.0. Can you imagine? Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Wow. Oh. Um, so Vegas. So Vegas. <laughs> they showed a lot of Vegas. <laughs> what was interesting to me in the preview bits, especially, I think this was like mostly in like the first two episodes at the very end were like coming up. Um, they they would show clips of Carlos's car breaking down, um, but with Charles's radio audio and I really thought that that was kind of weird because like it wasn't Charles's car that got exploded dinner time for Bishop 
check. Um, so I just, that, that was really weird to me. And then the opening ceremony bits behind the scenes was, was really kind of fun to, to watch because that was at the point of the weekend where a bulk of the drivers, including Max Verstappen were not happy to be there. They were like, this is so dumb. Why are we here? This pageantry is obnoxious. We just want to race these cars and we have to race these cars in the middle of the night because we're in Vegas and whatever. Um, so, you know, in the context of knowing that once they got to the race, and the race was great and they were all really excited because the race itself was awesome. Um, that, you know, it just makes all of the the complaints and like the behind the scenes, like not wanting to be there, just really like a little bit more entertaining than I think most people would feel, or maybe that's just me. Yeah. I think it's interesting that they completely, but you kind of called this like neglected to show how poorly the practice sessions went besides Carlos's car blowing up. But yeah, they did not put any of that in there. Um, I'm surprised that that we relived the the press conference with you know with Toto Toto and Fred. Like oh, I'm surprised it. that they I loved it, but I'm surprised that they included it. Um, See that I'm not though because it was it wasn't saying anything about. Well, it was in few few words, but just him saying like I'm pissed. This sucks. It's unacceptable, and I'm not talking to you guys about anything. I don't like, want to talk about it. I just love yeah. Toto come to his, his defense. Yeah, it was it, it it was great. I'm glad that we didn't have to relive the really awkward drive to the Bellagio after the race no. and all of that. Like, I'm glad we didn't have to relive any of that. And um, they they really, I don't I don't think that they overblew Vegas because Vegas ultimately did turn out to be one of the better races of last year, which we've discussed. Um, but yeah, it was like we knew we were gonna get. An entire race based on Vegas, and especially because at that point Mercedes and, and Ferrari were battling for P two, um, so yeah, it was it was it was fine. Yeah, it was at this point like Vegas where I was like, "Huh, where's Red Bull?" Yeah, <laughs> we're like yeah. at the eleventh hour here, and we still have yet to see yet to see Red Bull. Like, I don't know if Checo had one sound bite. I don't, did he? I don't, I don't remember. I don't if so. he did, it wasn't memorable. And they like teased Max coming back, and, and he didn't. And he didn't at all. He got a, again. He got like a fifteen second montage at the very end, and it was like world champion credits. <laughs> yeah. Done. On the one hand, I don't know if we needed Max and Checo's no. storylines to make a good ZTS season, but on the other hand, if Drive to Survive is meant to introduce new fans to Formula One in the United States, which that is one of the goals of Drive to Survive, yeah. then new fans who are coming in and binge watching all the way up to season six are going to be really confused about who won in 2023 because all you got was Christian Horner saying, you know, Max has has done what no driver has ever done before and won 95% of races and this will, you know, will never happen again, but that was barely covered. So it, it fails to give a lot of context, which is why I always I say that drive to survive is a primer for yeah. Formula One, but does not replace actually living through a year-long traveling circus. No, and I mean, I think it's good and it was intentional that they didn't make it the Red Bull Max show. Like, we got that mm-hmm. all season. We didn't need right. more more episodes of it, right? But they do... Drive to Survive takes... A, there's a departure from, like, reality and the stories, because I feel like this season, maybe more so than other seasons, it was very focused on team principles and management making decisions and not necessarily about the drivers, the racing, like mm-hmm. yes, the racing, but only the result and not necessarily like truly following Formula One in a season. It was like, let's cherry pick and find these small little cool stories that we can blow up into an episode, but it doesn't give you the full picture of the season. And I feel like older seasons used to do that yeah and i i just feel that they overcorrected on minimizing red bull just a little bit too much and they could have yeah. cut off 10 minutes of alpine coverage or even 10 minutes of alpha tauri coverage to you know show max you know at minimum showing max winning at qatar like at minimum winning the t- you know sealing the title yeah exactly and i think they could have really showed Checo too because Mm -hmm. I'm saying that um just showing because he had a really hard season and like his seat was questioned and that could have been thrown in with the Daniel Ricardo you know piece of it as well um 
I don't know. I feel like there was a story there that they could have told, but they just absolutely. So. Yeah. And I'm sorry that you didn't get to see the double DNF in Suzuka because they were focused on Yuki and Suzuka instead. It's okay because they still said double DNF a few times talking about yeah. Alpine because we had two episodes of Alpine. So I, st- yeah. I did still get to hear the double DNF, but it, it just wasn't Checo's. So yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. So this brings me to my hot take. <laughs> um, Zach Brown has personally victimized someone who works at Netflix because, oh my God, do they paint him in such a bad light. It's like someone woke up at Netflix and chose violence towards Zach Brown. They were like, we'll give you two minutes, not even two minutes, two seconds to walk through the facility with your dogs to make you look normal. And then every other cut, it's going to be, you look like a dick and we hate you and everyone else should hate you too. That is the vibe I got. He, he screams and oozes like greasy car salesmen. And yeah. I, I just can't like, and the weird montage of him sitting down with like VPs of marketing and sponsorship and being like, you got to believe in us. Like, I know this isn't the bet that you knew you wanted to make. Like that five minute conversation was so cringeworthy and terrible. I didn't yeah. need it. I didn't need any of the Zach Brown bits. Like him talking to Lando and being like upset with, it made it look like he was upset with some stuff that Lando was saying in a pre- press conference and just everything. I I didn't need that much Zach Brown. We got more Zach than we did Oscar Piastri. Which is bananas. Like, Which is crazy. Like, again, the Oscar storyline of everything that happened in the offseason, getting a seat, like the whole Alpine, I'm not with Alpine, I'm with McLaren. They could have done the first episode of, like, him. I know they didn't start mm-hmm. off great, but it's like, I want to know how he feels actually driving for McLaren now. I want to know more about him as a rookie. Again, I feel like we're getting these cherry picked storylines and we're not getting the full reality of the season. Because in previous seasons, I feel like we would have gotten at least half an episode on, Os- on Oscar Piastri. Yeah, I feel like we got a lot of McLaren is struggling, which rightfully they struggled a lot. We got the six the six pit stops in Bahrain. We got that, but we didn't get nearly as much of the success that they had down the line. Like obviously we saw Silverstone when they when they had recovered, um, but we didn't get enough of like how is Oscar Piastri the best rookie Formula One has seen since you know, Lewis Hamilton and Alex Albon when they were rookies, like yeah. that's, that's where, if you look historically, the amount of points scored, the performances, he is up there with Albon and Hamilton as, you know, one of the best rookies that, you know, modern Formula One has ever seen. And that was incredibly minimized this season. Yeah, it was. I don't know. I was, I was kind of disappointed with the, the McLaren highlights also because like Daniel Ricardo is coming back onto the grid I want to hear Zach Brown's take on it maybe he's not going to offer it up but come on producers ask the question like make him yeah. make him sweat in the chair like I want to know yeah they spent allegedly 18 million dollars for Daniel not to drive only to go back to Red Bull and end up in the car anyway um yeah their so... second highest paid driver was driving for Alphatari. yeah like awkward it's we didn't get any of that. And that's like, that's what I want to see. And I know I said that in our, in our prediction episode or pod for uh drive to survive, but that's what I want to see. <laughs> yeah. But I did get something I really wanted, which is I, like yeah. three fourths of an episode with James Bowles. Oh my yeah. God. I could sit and listen to him talk about caffeine and how it works in your body. <laughs> yeah. All hours of every day. I don't know why, but and I love how he's like a self-proclaimed nerd. He's like, I would, I do lean up towards like the nerdy, geeky side, and I really we like know. Data. And data drives results, and I'm like, yes, James, give it to me, give me all the data. I did not know that decaf uh, still had caffeine in it. It just didn't have as much like as a full caffeinated coffee. You learn something new every day from James Wolves. But this was the best. He's so good. I love him and Toto's relationship too. Yeah. Of like Toto helping him. And it I didn't realize either that it's a very outside the box hire. Like I knew he yes. knew, but I didn't realize like just how out of the box and from left field the hire was. And like until having it shown to me in an episode. Because it's not something I necessarily thought about. But like yeah. watching it and hearing it, it's like, oh wow, no, this actually makes sense. Like he's never managed a team anybody because he's just been an engineer 
Yeah, and he he's come in and he made a huge impact at Williams this season. I I loved when like he was like struggling to int- like introduce himself. Um, it, you know when when he was sitting down for the interviews, like everything about James Vowles in Drive to Survive, like we need more of him. Like let him be the new Gunther, um, and and just have him you know doing all that stuff. I also was really surprised at his at the way Netflix, like that little clip of him talking to Lawrence Stroll. Lawrence Stroll. I was was, the same thing. Yeah, I was very pleasantly surprised at the relationship that those two have um because I'm, I'm not sure where it came from because I was thinking you know yeah La- you know Lance drove for Williams but that was when James was still an engineer at Mercedes. at Mercedes so I'm not sure where that came from but I was pleasantly surprised um and I think that we could have done you know I know why we had to have the full you know a full half of an episode on Haas and why they had to split it with Williams but I think that they really could have minimized Haas and I know that they did it because of Gunther um you got one title card at the end that said okay goodbye Gunther um he's not renewed and they had that little you know bit when Gunther was talking to the the producer about how fun it was to to talk but I would you know I would rather have like a super cut of Formula One team principals ordering food and talking about food um and have that included in the because like if you think about it you know Toto you know ordering his pumpernickel bread and like just all the team principals ordering food in the hospitality suite someone please make me a super cut of that it's so great the one thing that i was disappointed in the williams episode was that we didn't get anything on logan Sargent, and i know that's right strange coming from me but it's so it's such low like uh low-hanging fruit and such an easy win to just highlight him and show his struggles and show him you know growing or something um i was surprised that they didn't really highlight the rookies because last season when it was joe guan yu's rookie season they really highlighted him yeah, so, they, they hammered that into the ground, especially because that crash at Silverstone. Right. And so it was interesting to me that they didn't really talk about the – like, Nick DeVries got a, a big highlight reel, but that's also because of what happened to him. Um, yeah. And granted, Sargent's season was a little lackluster, but he is the only American driver. Well, so and was Oscar was Nick Piast. DeVries, and Nick, Nick right. DeVries got a house tour. <laughs> right. Well, and then, I mean, Oscar Piastri, for having such a great season that he did, he was barely highlighted, so. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, we could have cut, you know, I know I know why they had the the scene of Lando and Zach golfing, um, but they could have cut that and put, you know, Oscar Piastri and Oscar Piastri's mom, who was hilarious on social media, freaking out about her son. Like, they Netflix, you do better next time. Um, but... I think we've, we've hammered home all the things that we want to highlight. Obviously, there were things that they missed. But what are your, like, overall thoughts on the season? So, overall, I didn't love it. And I think it's, again, because it made a departure from, like, following the season and really following the championships and following, you know, both drivers and constructors. And it really has stepped into this cherry-picked storyline, not necessarily following the season. I think we got way too much like in race coverage which again is fine but it's already happened we know the end result or you can google it um I think we got a lot from the team principal perspective and we've taken a step away from the drivers maybe that was intentional maybe that's just how I see it but I just I didn't love it I felt like it didn't connect when in previous seasons like we've gone kind of from the beginning to the end going back and forth a little bit here and there, but then we always end up with like the championship race and um, for constructors and the drivers where this year, Mm -hmm. yes, Red Bull ran away with it, but the fight between P2 to P what even five was really close. And they didn't cover any of that until like the last five minutes of the last episode when they decided to highlight the Mercedes Red Bull piece like that, or the Mercedes uh, Ferrari piece, Um, which I think they could have sprinkled that in throughout the episodes to show like how close it was. Um, Cause like you said, if someone is coming to this, not knowing F1, it doesn't paint like the, the, the full picture of, of the 2023 season. Yeah. And not only that, it just doesn't paint any picture of reality. And obviously, you know, Drive to Survive is one step above a reality show, but 
it it ignored the fact that you know Red Bull was incredibly do- like it didn't ignore Red Bull's dominance, but it didn't explain Red Bull's dominance in a way that I think it should have. I would say that- it almost it ignored their dominance. Besides, like Christian Horner's comment about Ma- about Max's achievements, because exactly like, I didn't it did not read as Red Bull was a dominant team this season. Yeah, it, it's it's it read as who won in 2023. Do yeah. we do we know was that was that, you know, you know, obviously it wasn't close, but it it still like I said earlier, they overcorrected. That said, I preferred season 6 to season 5. I I remember and I was discussing this with my dad. We both felt that like season 5 was a season that we had to get through, and obviously I watched season 6 in seven and a half hours so it you know i i thought it was better um they they definitely you know ignored some things that they shouldn't have ignored um and you know over focused on alpine in a way that i do not care about even though they have 800 famous people that have bought into the the team and i i just think that we didn't need all of that and that they could have saved that second episode for something you know actually better and and relevant that said i give it i give it a b i give it a solid b see yeah i just i miss maybe the episodes of old of seeing like daniel ricardo on his farm in australia and yuki yeah you know in the dorms of red eating. bull and eating and you know carlos signs with his dad just like hanging out doing extracurriculars like I like those moments when it really bridges like the drivers to fans and makes them people and gives us their real personality and helps us understand them as humans. Like that's the part of the show that I really like is getting to see them as humans and not just like sitting in a race car. Cause I can watch sitting in a race car. We do that anyway. Yeah, exactly. But like, I want to know, I would have loved to hear Max talk about his season because he's like, yeah, our car is really dominant, but I would have loved to get, Who am I? I would have loved to get like a whole Red Bull montage of the entire season where Max talks about, you know, how much Singapore sucked and how he felt after all the other races and hearing Christian say, great job, Max, after like every single race. But I would have liked to know more from his perspective, like how he truly felt, how he was truly feeling after every race, the pressure he was under. Like, I want to hear about those things, too. So, yeah, I don't know. Agreed. I will also say I love the little bit of Carlos with his mom, because obviously Carlos has one of the most famous dads in motorsport in Carlos Sign Sr. Um, but to, you know, have have that moment of leaving the hotel in Italy with his mom, who is just like seeing him surrounded by these Ferrari fans who are screaming his name and she's just like, Like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, I'm really glad that we got to see a little bit more from, you know, her perspective because, you know, we don't see a lot of the moms. Um, So it it was cool to have that inclusion. Like, you know, even Max Verstappen's mom, she, she was a, she was a kart racer. She, you know, he, he didn't just get the racing gene from Jos Verstappen and his dad's side of the family. Like Sophie Coogan is also a a racer. I family bonding episode of the Verstappens. (laughs) Well, I think that there's, a, a, you know, from from what I've seen on the Wikipedia page, there is a reason why Jos Verstappen and Sophie Kuben have divorced. So I don't think we're ever going to see anything about that. But want, you're right. There I should be more of that yacht. family human element. Yeah. And like we got a little bit of it with like Esty Bestie and his parents, but like it was super awkward yeah. and it seemed like extremely staged and forced. Like I want to see- You mean on the yacht? Over- yeah. I want to see all the Verstappens on the yacht and I want to see who gets thrown off the yacht first. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the answer is uh, Max's mom yeets Yos Verstappen off the yacht. Oh my God. Some, something, something tells me that that's, that's what we would see happen if the entire Verstappen family was on the yacht. Um, um, and, you know, Victoria Verstappen and her cute kids, his sister, and of course, Max's girlfriend who um, had a child with the guy who Max took his race seat from, which, as we know, is one of the most entertaining stories of the backstories well, of, Max, of Formula One. Max also has like a two or three year old sister from Yosa's like most recent marriage or relationship. Yes. So I was like, oh, it's like a nephew. And it's like, oh, wait, no, it's sister, sibling. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, keeping up with the Verstappens, am I right? 
Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully we see more of that human element uh, next season. But yeah, I mean, we we made it through Drive to Survive is here, but Drive to Survive means we can close the book on 2023. And we are now in 2024. It is race week. Uh, We will be back on Thursday with our Bahrain preview. And I I got to wrap my head around Bahrain and what's happening there. I can't believe we are already at Bahrain. I can't believe it. Well, testing happened. Red Bull looks fast. Oh. That's all we need to talk about for testing. I know. There's really not much, me- not much else out there. Oh, well, like Catherine said, it is race week. We will have our Bahrain preview on Thursday. That has been our Drive to Survive recap. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.